this afternoon to go in the book of Ephesians. We have been studying and taking baby steps. And although Ephesians is a short book, only six chapters, it has a wealth of information. And I have been gaining a lot of wisdom as we study this book of Ephesians. So, so far we learned that Paul has been in prison and while he's in prison, he's encouraging the believers. He's telling them about Jesus Christ. He's telling them about grace, a gift. He considers himself such a humble person being asked to deliver this powerful message. So as we start in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, I'm just going to read the first few verses. And then I'm going to ask Elder Bennett to just take it apart for us piece by piece slowly but surely so let's begin at verse 1 I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that he walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So we're just going to start in the first few verses and it, it starts similar to chapter 3 he reminds us yes that yeah I am a prisoner of the Lord and he's in loneliness meekness suffering for forbearing in love break that down why did he even start to tell us loneliness meekness forbearing elder or it's essential qualities that we need to be united in Christ and unity is strength. We have frequently heard that, that, that statement. And so when Paul is speaking here about unity and he begins to say in lowliness and meekness, break that down for us, Elder. No, these are essential qualities that we need to be united in Christ and to be united with, with each other. So Paul is explaining in Ephesians, the, the plan that God has laid out um, for his, all his children to, to be united in him and to be united as a church for us to reveal to the world the religious experience that we have with him. So loneliness is important, meekness is important, long-suffering is important, forbearing one another in love is important and endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace it is only through the spirit that we can have this kind of, of unity and it comes only as we are united on an individual basis with 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 the lord only as we become as an individual but we are so different how can there be unity with so many differences the the unity that christ desires is 
is a kind of unity in diversity. But that diversity has to do with the fact that we, we think differently. The fact that we may do things a bit different. But it is all rooted and grounded in the truth of his words and in following after the leading of the Holy Spirit. So it's not just about being in the spirit. We need to remember that he is a spirit of truth. He is a spirit of truth. So being united in the spirit has to do with being united in, in, in following after how the spirit leads. And the spirit leads according to his word, according to scriptures. Indeed. So does it mean that we have to look alike? I mean, I know frequently we, 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 we want to dress alike. We want to be able to identify like a Seventh-day Adventist or, you know, a Christian person, you know, supposed to look a certain way. Does this unity that you're speaking about mean that we are supposed to probably look the same way? not necessarily look the same way however it is important for us to reflect the character of christ it's important for us to be, be seen as those who represent christ so in some cases our appearance may send a strong message a message to say well this person is reflecting the image of christ this person is reflecting the likeness of christ however not at all times will the appearance be the same or we can judge by the appearance however we need to be guided by the, the principles of, of of modesty as outlined in scripture when it comes to um attire have you and heard appearance. the book, um, the, the phrase, you can know a book by its cover? Yes, I've heard the term. You can judge a book. That's the, that's the word, judge a book. Judge a book by its cover. I don't know if that's always correct. And the spirit of prophecy mentioned that the outward appearance is an index to the heart. But someone will mention that Christ said that Man looks on the outward appearance, but Christ God looks, on the, looks on the heart. Yes. However, we have to create a balance between uh, these notions. We have to meet, remember that God wants us to represent him in, in our appearances and how we put ourselves together. It tells a, a powerful message as to who we are with and what we represent. So we have to be mindful um, that in our conduct, in our behavior, in our attire, we, we preach, preach Christ. That is so true. But at the same time, too, we have to also not be too judgment. How does culture play a role, though, in this unity and the appearance you know, I mean, unity in diversity. How can we, I am from the Caribbean, you are from Africa, you are from Asia, and you are worshiping Christ. Uh, how, how does this unity, you know, how is it demonstrated? Now, <laughs> there, there are certain things that are cultural, well, should I say cultural norms for, for, for certain regions? Yes. Or certain backgrounds and those have to be taken in con into consideration even as it relates to the way we worship some persons may may prefer certain forms of of, of say music certain persons may be content with just uh just say an organ or or a keyboard there are other churches that may not be comfortable, may not be comfortable with yes. any musical instrument, so right. to speak. There are some 
locations where the worship style is is very lively, a kind of revival type. There are others who are more, uh, say, sublime, more sobering, conservative. conservative. So there are different ways in which uh, different individual groups, due to culture, may 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 may, may worship the Lord. Um, dress and so on forms part of a form, form part of, of, of one's culture. However, the underlying principle of modesty uh, cuts across culture, and we have to be mindful of that. And the underlying principle of Christ-like behavior as well cuts across culture, and we have to be mindful of that. We also need to be mindful that there are certain cultural practices that go contrary to biblical principles, and for those, we cannot compromise on them. If there are, say, evil practices that are ingrained in certain cultures, we cannot incorporate those into our worship or into our lifestyle. We have to abstain totally from those practices and hold on to um, that which is good. If there's a style of dress, so to speak, that is modest and in keeping with the principles of modesty as outlined in the Bible, even if the world adopts it, there's there's no objection for Christians to adopt that kind of of, of, of dress once it is it is it is it is modest, once it is healthy, once it provides sufficient covering and it looks tasteful. Um, similarly for certain foods, once they are healthy different cultures will 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 highlight different dishes so once they are healthy and wholesome then they will be okay for 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 his people or for Christians to consume so there there are going to be cultural differences however we need to be united in in Christ as it relates to the underlying principles that are outlined in the Bible. Amazing, because I believe that Paul was deliberate in how he organized or how, how the book of Ephesians and how the letter has been written, because he would have started by speaking about your relationship with Jesus Christ, sharing that love and also, we spoke earlier about the vertical, the relationship with God, and then the horizontal relationship. He prayed for the believers that the love of God will dwell in their hearts. And I believe once that connection is made, he has laid the foundation for this unity that he is speaking about. Last week, we spoke about the mystery of the gospel, knowing that that person, that brother that's beside you, there's a level of equality. God has called us all. He didn't just call the Jews, but also the Gentiles as well. And look at God's creation. Look at us. We are all different. You'll have 10 children, same parents, and you wonder how the same ingredients will result in a different appearance. Yes, you can see the, the painting, the, the, the backdrop and the resemblance, but God is such a, an amazing God that, that there are differences with each individual. So as we continue in Ephesians, I'm going to go ahead and read verses 7 to 14, and then we will just delve into those verses as well. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto them. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended 
is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that ye henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And that's a mouthful. More, more than a mouthful. <laughs> that's a mouthful. But I want you to break down for me verse 7, 8, where he's speaking about ascending and descending. What is Paul referring to here when he speaks about the ascension and descension? Well, he ascended up on high would imply that he first descended. We know that Christ was with the Father uh, from all eternity. And there is a plan, a covenant made in eternity in the event that man sinned, that Christ would die. So he left his glory above and came to this earth, descended to this earth, and became a human being and suffered the penalty of sin that we should have born. So he descended from his exalted position as the son of God and took upon mankind, took upon himself the form of a servant and died the death. So he, was, he lived a life, a perfect life, above sin. He was crucified, laid in the tomb, was resurrected, and ascended. And in descending or taking on our place, he offered us grace, undeserved, because we were lost. We were captive. We were, led to, we were in captivity to sin because of. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So the human race was held captive in the devil's power. And by his victorious life above sin, by him dying and being resurrected, triumph over death, he now has the keys of death and, and hell. And he has ascended to the Father. Father has granted him all power and authority in heaven and on earth. And it was out of that power and authority that he could send the gift of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the early church. And it is through that power and authority having ascended that he can bestow upon his people upon his disciples now gifts and it is through that power and authority that the latter rain there's going to be another outpouring of the Holy Spirit to finish the work before he comes and that kind of power and authority will be to as the, the, the scripture says and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, perfecting in knowledge and, and holiness for the work of the ministry, the ministry having to do with the salvation of souls and the edifying of the body of Christ, the building up of the body of Christ, the building up of God's people in, in preparing them to, to showcase the character of God in this world before he before he comes 
So I must ask, does everyone have a gift? Gift. Sorry, I noticed that they are listed here: apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists. Uh, what if I don't fall in one of those categories? Now, I would say that everyone who has given their heart to the Lord, who have come into a personal relationship with Christ, who have made a surrender to Christ, has been blessed with some gift, some blessing from the Lord in which that person can use it to glorify God and to lead one to Christ or to lead one to have a better relationship with Christ. So... Is some is 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 one gift better than the other gift? No gift is better than the the other. And the story that is used in Sabbath's lesson is very interesting. The story has to do with the fact that there were body parts arguing about their their importance, and and we know that the story could be told in so many <laughs> in so many different in so many different ways. It, it could mention many other body parts arguing about their importance and, it, and when you think of it though th there's a powerful lesson there there's a, there's a powerful um, spiritual point that Paul is saying that each body part or each member in the church each member in the body of Christ each gift is, is very important and there's no more no gift is more say more important than the other but all should work together as one all should work together as 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 Christ is one with the with the Father. What a wonderful God. Well, on the other side of the break, we are gonna to continue to speak about this unity in diversity and how God would have made it happen, put us together as one body functioning in unity and in love at the end of this song. The world is full with sin's fury Evil men and seducers wax worse But the signs around us are telling God is coming to end the curse Should we sacrifice trust in the Bible? Should we crucify Jesus again? Must we give up the faith that has led us this far? Hold fast, fight on to the end. Apostates love to the fable, and the preachers supply their demands. The state will enforce their darkness against the Lord's commands. Should we sacrifice trust in the Bible? Should we crucify Jesus again? Must we give up the faith that has led us this far? Hold fast, fight on to the end. We are at that moment in history that the prophets of old long to see. We stand on the threshold of glory, oh, glory for you and should we sacrifice trust in the Bible? Should we crucify Jesus again? Must we give up the faith that has led us this far? Hold fast, fight on to the end. Must we give up the faith that has led us this far? No, hold fast, fight on to the end. Hold fast, fight on to the end. If you're in a situation that you sometimes feel like giving up, this song is a powerful reminder and encouragement for us to hold fast till the end. Ephesians is written against the backdrop 
of Paul being a prisoner, yet finding words of knowledge, finding words of wisdom and words of encouragement that he gives to the believers and also to the Gentiles. So as we continue under the caption this week, the unified body of Christ, I must ask the question, Elder, how do we achieve this growth and maturity within the body of Christ? The, the growth and maturity that the body of Christ needs has to be based on individual growth. Each member growing in Christ such that they're in the diversity, there is unity. So, I remember that in, in it was July 4th, 2005, at the 58th General Conference session that we adopted a, a new fundamental belief, growing, growing in Christ. And that belief speaks to how each member or each person can grow. How we are called to follow Christ's example. And when we experience His salvation, when His Holy Spirit dwell within our hearts and empower us, when we are committed to Him, when we are set free from our, our past and the burden of our sins, we no longer live in darkness and we no longer live in fear. We, we sing His praises. We gather together for worship. And we participate in the mission of, of, the, of the church. So we are called to follow his example and also to minister to, to others, to the needs of humanity. And as we give ourselves in loving service to those around us and witness to his salvation, his constant presence with us through the Holy Spirit will transform us and give us a fulfilling spiritual experience. In God's amazing grace, we are told that a union of believers with Christ will, as a natural result, lead to a union with, with one another, which bond of union is the most enduring upon the earth. So, as we are united with Christ individually, we'll be united with each other. In Christ and that kind of unity the unity in the body of Christ will be a powerful witnessing tool to bring others to a saving relationship in Christ so it is a very important topic you know even Jesus prayed for that unity in his last prayer with his disciples and as a matter of fact he prayed not only for the unity of his disciples then but the unity of, of all believers until he returns, including us. So it is one of our most urgent and important need. But as with all gifts, as with all needs, you know, they come with prerequisites or, or requirements. God is offering this unity, but there is something that we need to do on, on our part. And Christ's object lesson gives, gives, gives us an idea. Page 327 says, Not until through faith and prayer disciples had surrendered themselves fully for his working was the outpouring of the Spirit received. So individually, we have to exercise faith and pray and surrender ourselves that we may be united with Christ. 
And when we, we are united with Christ, then the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon us. And the, the, Sister White went on to say, the gifts are already ours in Christ, but their actual possession depends upon our reception of the Spirit of God. It is somewhat like having title, but not having possession. So the gifts are already ours. We have tackled to them, but in order to have possession, we have to accept. We have to accept accept Christ. Are there still apostles and prophets among us? I notice that in verse eleven, to some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. I would say yes, there are still apostles among us. Um, we may not recognize them as such, but apostles means one who is sent by God. Uh, they are prophets, and prophets have various uh, duties. You know, Jesus referred to John the Baptist as as one of the greatest prophets. But if we look at the the ministry of John the Baptist, he did not necessarily um, speak a lot about things that are going to happen outside of the fact that Christ is going to come who is greater than himself but yet still he was considered one of the greatest prophets so a prophet is one who you know foretells tells beforehand um, tells for God and, um, and and tells promptly for God so we have prophets and there will be prophets until till Christ Christ return. There are apostles in the sense that there are persons whom God has chosen to be and has sent into the world to preach and to teach and to prepare for his coming. There are evangelists. We are more familiar with that term of those who are preaching and teaching and you know baptizing souls for the kingdom. There are teachers. That's easily understood to to mean, you know, those who teach lesson and expound on the and word. expound on the word, whether it is Bible class or Sabbath school lesson, or teachers within our institutions, and so on. So, we have the manifestation of these gifts in in the church, as 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 we speak. I always believe when we study the word of God, we must not only study in isolation of what was happening back in Ephesus. But I believe there must be present day connection to our lives as we are now. And as I think about spiritual maturity, it leads me to question whether after being in the church we should be growing so we wouldn't have come at a level you started your journey with christ you were baptized at an evangelistic campaign and you were at a high does that mean that you you don't grow does that mean that this is where you are at and this is where you stay once you have become a member of the church the, the path of the just is as a shining light that goes brighter and brighter so once we enter a relationship with Christ we should go from strength to strength from glory to glory on a daily basis. That's why it's important to read our Bibles and pray every day that we will grow. Because if we remain stagnant, if we don't do these things and become stagnant, then we are going to obviously regress. And that kind of regression may cause us to, to go to a, a worse state than we were before. So it's very important for us to, to grow. And we grow through a study of his word, we go through prayer and meditation, 
we go through witnessing about the the goodness of God and what God has done in our lives and leading others to experience that that joy. So without that growth, that's why it's essential that we grow, grow in Christ. Without that growth, then our experience is going to be stunted and we are going to fall back into the path of, of, of perdition. So growth is essential. And I like what it says in verse 14, and I think it adds to the conversation about why it's essential for us to experience growth. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So that speaks to having that growth and spending time in the word, as you mentioned, so that we can be not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Because if you notice, there are so many things happening and a lot of the doctrines seem quite authentic. And if you are not grounded in the word yourself, then you'll find yourself tossed to, to and fro. And fro. So that, that is why it is important for us to highlight the need to be united in the word, united in, in scriptures or in the scripture. Because if we just talk about the spirit, you know, if we just talk about feelings and we just consider not not wanting to to hurt feelings or being sensitive then then we are going to miss miss what it is that the lord wants us to, to to do what 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 are his commands what what is the path that he wants us to he wants to take us many know so little about their bibles that they are unsettled in the faith they remove the old landmarks and fallacies and winds of doctrine blow them hither and thither. Science for the so-called is wearing away the foundation of Christian principle. And those who once were in the faith drift away from the Bible landmarks and divorce themselves from God whilst they're claiming to be his children. Uh, and this is from Evangelism, page 362 and 363. See, 363. The church needs to awake to an understanding of the, the subtle powers of satanic agencies that must be met. If they will keep on the whole armor, they will be able to conquer all the foes they meet, some of which are not yet developed. Can you imagine that? So, yes, there's a call for unity. And God wants us to be united. But we have to be mindful too that there are forces at work to undo the unity or to prevent this kind of unity and scatter the body of Christ with every wind of doctrine. So that is why it's important for us to know what is true, what is the correct doctrine to follow so that we are led by the Spirit into all truth because that's one of the work of the Spirit to lead us to all, into all truth. When I researched on an, an amount of denominations that currently exist in Christianity, I found that there are over 45,000 denominations. <laughs> that cemented in my mind how easy it is to be tossed to and fro. We read earlier, and I must go back to the seven ones found in verse 4 and 5 of Ephesians 4. There's one body, one spirit, even as we are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father 
of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Unity. And one baptism, that, that subject is something that we have discussed in Christendom a lot. Tell me, what is your takeaway on one baptism? It, it is probably useful for me to begin by looking at what one baptism is, is not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously one baptism is not talking about baptizing just once because you remember that in the early church there were some who were baptized unto John's baptism and yet still they were rebaptized, so to speak Yes. so yes. one baptism does not mean that you're baptized only, only once right um, secondly, let us look at the significance of, of, of baptism. What does baptism um, represent? It's, it's a public show that you have taken on on Christ, that you have been snatched from the 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 the, the kingdom of darkness, and now that you have put on the banner of Christ. You have accepted Christ as your personal savior from sin. One baptism in the sense that it is only through the merits and sacrifice of Jesus Christ can you now live that new life. And when you're baptized, you're acknowledging that you have been exposed to the truth of salvation or the sacrifice that is only available through through Christ. All persons who are who are baptized, so to speak, in Christ, all persons who are saved by their faith in Christ can only be be, be saved through the sacrifice that, that Jesus made. So that one baptism has to do with the work and the understanding, well, the work that Christ has done and the understanding of, 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 of his sacrifice to save um, humanity and acknowledging his work and his sacrifice in doing just that for, for all of us. Now, one God and Father is, is I would say, self-expansory. We have only one, one Father. Uh, one one faith, it is only through exercising faith in the merits of Christ. It is only through Christ that we are saved. We can be, there's no other name through which we can be saved. There's one Lord, there's only one mediator between Christ, between God and man, and it is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, there's only one hope, and that hope is in, in Christ. Hope, you know, the Advent hope. Hope in his coming. Hope in his, 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 his life. Hope in his transforming power to, to renew us. There's only one body. And he's the head of the body of believers. There may be many de denominations. Yes, he has said, other sheep have I, which are not of this fold. Then will I bring... And there is going to be one shepherd and one fool. But we have to look at the body of Christ uh, holistically, representing the body of, of believers. You know, and by that I mean individuals who are living up to the light that they know across the world and in all these different um, denominations they are not just confined to one particular denomination but as God unfolds his, his himself and he unfolds truth Bible believing children of his will accept the truth as they are as they are revealed 
Amazing. This is indeed a powerful, powerful, powerful lesson. So frequently we find reasons for differences. How we look, where we are from, our culture. We find every reason to be different. And God is an amazing God. He made us all different. We, we look different and we think differently. However, we are called to unity. And I believe this unity is not just theoretical. This unity comes alone from God and a connection with God. It's not something I can sit and decide that, okay, just like I should decide to paint all the walls white or paint everything brown or paint everything black. This unity only God can give. When we have that connection with Jesus Christ, I believe the unity just spills over with our relationship with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. So I'll continue verse 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Elder Bennett, Christ is the head. Here we see Paul using a metaphor. Yes. And he's speaking, we spoke about the body and he spoke about the joints and the connection with the joints. And as you visualize, what comes to your mind when you think of that description that Paul puts here in verse 15 and 16? How do we live this connection? It's very critical for us to be joint or to mm -hmm. be connected to Christ. And that's the only way we can have unity with each other. If on an individual basis, we are connect, we are each connected to Christ. And, and that is the, the, the picture or the model we have here, where as the members are joined to the body, then we can be connected, then we can be, be unified, then we can have a unified body. But if the members are not connected to Christ, then the members cannot be united. Sometimes and you have to amputate a leg, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if if the, the leg is disconnected from the body, we know that that body part has no use. That body part has no life in it. So it's very important for us to stay connected to Christ. Paul mentioned speaking the truth in love and then yes. edifying of itself in love. And here again, the great example of love is the death of Christ on the cross. That's the greatest demonstration of how much God loved us or God loves us. And being touched by that love, experiencing that love, will prompt us to share that love with, with, with one another. God loves me. And it is as we experience the love of God in our daily lives, in our daily experiences, that we'll be led to to even love our, our our brethren more so it is even beyond you know the commandment you know love thy neighbor as you love thyself but as god loves us as we see how much he he cares for us 
as we see how much he has lavished his love on us, we'll be prompted to, to love each other and let them or, or encourage them to experience that great love that the Lord has so greatly lavished on us. How do you speak the truth in love though, Elder, when someone would have outrightly done something that needs reprimand and and correction speaking the truth in love what does that look like speaking the truth in love first it comes from that the mindset that you love the person uh, we, are, we, are, we are encouraged to love even our enemies so once we love the individual then our spirit and, and manner in how we present whatever it is that we're going to speak to them will be guided by, 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 by scripture. It will be reflected in a spirit and manner that communicates that love. It's not saying that we're not going to be firm where necessary, uh, maybe blunt sometimes, but never 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 rude never coarse never uncouth never you know what is unbecoming of someone who is in love with christ so the spirit and the manner must demonstrate that what is being said it may not necessarily be palatable to the individual but it's for the persons eternal good and so Paul goes down to practicality in this chapter of Ephesians he tells us how to be united he speaks about the roles of the different members of the church and now he's telling us speaking the truth in love indeed these are some practical practical lessons I want to share, I would like you to share with the listeners what are the key takeaways from the study this week captioned the unified body of Christ. God wants his body to be united in him. by his spirit but in his truth the spirit is the spirit of truth there is diversity or in diversity there is unity but it is only as we commit ourselves on an individual basis that we can be connected to christ and then on a larger basis be connected or have this unity with each other. Yes, we need to speak the truth in love. We are going to have at times divisions, but the truth must be spoken in love. It must have a redemptive influence because Christ is the head. He is desirous of saving all of his children. And the unity for which he prayed can only be realized if on an individual basis we, we submit to him, we allow his Holy Spirit to, to lead our lives and live and, and, and direct our lives. And we are given gifts. The main gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because of what he has done, based on, what, based on what he has committed, we have tackled. But it is for us to receive the gift in order to have possession. And the gift is given for the perfecting of the saints, the perfecting of knowledge of Christ, and the perfecting as it relates to holiness. 
and for the building up or edification of the the body of Christ and God wants us to have these gifts to be closely connected with him to grow in him so that we can be co-laborers with him we can be prepared for his soon return and and usher in his 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 second advent Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us through our study. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to help us to reflect your love, to reflect your truth in our lives. Help us to commit to you, to be totally surrendered to you, and to in prayer and Bible study and in witnessing grow from strength to strength in you help us to recognize that it is only as we are united in you that we can be united with each other and we pray Lord that you may keep us in your grace so that when you come we'll be ready and waiting to heal you as our personal saver from sin please bless all of us and bless our, especially our listeners and bring healing and full restoration to Elder Rassi. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Caleb and Joshua of the land David and Samson will surely sing on